I'm Chef John Foles. Food is so much more than nutrition here in the South. Every weekend on Louisiana's back roads and bayous, our festivals celebrate the food, music, and cultures that make us unique. Why not join me as we visit the fairs and festivals of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Funding for this program is provided by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Vieux Carré, Zydeco, Achafalaya, Natchitoches. In Louisiana, you'll say things you've never seen before. With over 400 food festivals in Louisiana, organizers have to become very creative when selecting a name for their celebrations. Over in Morgan City, Louisiana, the Shrimp and Petroleum Festival is named for two of our state's greatest natural resources. Our sweet potato celebration in Opelousas is called the Yambalee Festival in honor of our Louisiana yam. Use your own imagination as to the origin of the Celtic Nation Festival. Here in my own hometown of Donaldsonville, Louisiana, there's a festival held each October named in honor of this bridge, which became a natural corridor of growth for this small Cajun community. Welcome to one of the oldest cities in Louisiana and to the Sunshine Festival. Not only is Donaldsonville one of the oldest cities in Louisiana, founded in 1806, it served as our state capital prior to the Civil War. Railroad Avenue, our main street, is flanked on each side by buildings dating back to the mid-19th century, most with unique architectural design. The Security Industrial Insurance Building started out as a bank over 100 years ago. Many of the older buildings, having served numerous owners over the years, have today been converted into restaurants and other businesses. The Sunshine Festival is held each October and is coordinated by members of the Donaldsonville Chamber of Commerce. This food festival takes place right in the heart of downtown, and a wild game competition attracts many of the area's premier cooks. Here, Team 7, headed by Mark Jones, cooks turtle sauce pecan that certainly looks and smells like a winner. It's interesting to see the level of competition that takes place at these festivals. Some take the challenge so seriously that they construct and name their mobile kitchens before heading out for festivals throughout the state. Jimmy Bobbin from the town of Sanama simmers a 20-gallon iron pot filled with wild rabbit fricassee. He brings this 100-year-old pot into the 20th century with a handmade stainless steel lid. Jimmy's trailer is equipped with one piece of cooking equipment seldom seen outside of Bayou Country, the Cajun microwave. This stainless steel chest becomes an oven for a well-seasoned suckling pig. Once placed on the rack, hot coals or a wood fire is built right on top of the metal lid, allowing the meat to cook by radiant heat. It's fantastic. Scott Stevens, one of the few cooks with a woman assistant in this contest, stirs his cast iron pot of perfectly cooked venison and smoked sausage jambalaya. The sausage flavors the rice with a pecan taste, and I have to say, I think this one's a winner too. Yep, Kenny Fredericks, a local cook well known in Donaldsonville, has won this competition for the past two years, and it seems again that this year, his shrimp, crawfish, and crab gumbo is again going to be terrific and hard to beat. Walking down Main Street with the Queens, Heather Hayward and Shauna Bozeman makes it just a little bit easier for us to get free samples of food from the cooks. Here we tasted Donald Acosta and Jay Lemon's crab and shrimp stew. And I tell you, it's so hard to pick a winner. It's going to be tough this year. The Restored Elks Home is the meeting place for the five judges who were selected to choose today's winners. The competition is indeed tough, but after all, that's why most people attend a Louisiana festival to search out the best food in all of America. The toughest thing about being a chef living in a town like Donaldsonville 
is to have so many great cooks living there as well. You can imagine how many debates break out just about every day about who has the best recipe for jambalaya? Who makes the best teal duck braised in a nice sherry sauce? I tell you, the debate will go on forever in a town like Donaldsonville. The great thing about this festival, though, is that all of the foods are featured in some fashion around wild game because you have to remember that the Acadian coast of Louisiana is right in that area. In fact, the Mississippi River borders us on one side, the swamp lands of Louisiana on the other. And that's the greatest pantry of raw ingredients any cook could ever hope for. So wild game is in abundance, so naturally the competition would feature wild game in some fashion. So it's easy to choose the dishes that I'm going to prepare for you today. Coming into the kitchen just a little bit later is a very good friend of mine, somebody I've known for years and years in Donaldsonville. Somebody, in fact, who even inspired me to cook as a young boy when she called me Johnny. I'm sure she's going to call me that today, Rosemary Sims Barnbaum. She's going to be in the kitchen to talk about us growing up in Donaldsonville and all the great foods there. But first, let's cook our first dish today. Look out, look on this little platter here. I have some of the wonderful dishes, uh, one, wonderful ingredients that's going to go into the first dish. This is a little teal duck. I think this little wild duck is one of the best, most flavorful ducks in all of Cajun country. We're going to take the breast off to create a hopping john that's made with this rice. This here is a pecan flavored rice, one of the nice flavored rices that come out of the fields of Louisiana. Of course, we're going to throw some pecans in it because pecans will give us that really nice nutty flavor as well as crunch. And then the main ingredient going into the Hoppin' John is black-eyed peas, brought to Louisiana by the Africans many, many years ago. And in fact, they call this congri, black-eyed peas or congri. So this is a Hoppin' John. Most people call it Hoppin' John in the, in, the, in the southeast. We refer to it as some form of jambalaya. I've already taken the breast off of the little teal ducks, and I have them right here in the platter next to my big platter. And I'm going to season them with a little bit cracked black pepper. I'm going to put a little touch of salt on top of them as well and go ahead and throw some uh, Worcestershire for color. This will help them with a nice color. And then, of course, put some dried herbs or fresh herbs, whichever you would like, and kind of pound that flavor in. And then a little bit pepper sauce, a little bit Louisiana pepper sauce for spice. Now, you can dredge them in a little flour if you wanted to. I don't because whenever I put any of these uh, meats in a rice dish, I don't want to put flour. It'll kind of thicken the sauce a little bit, and that's not what I'm looking for. I'm going to put a little bit of my oil. This is just a vegetable oil. You can use, if you want to cut back on oil, just go ahead and put maybe some vegetable spray down in here to saute the breast. Just cook it on a little lower uh, heat. I'm going to raise my heat up here, and then put the breast skin side down first, right down into my skillet to sear in all of that nice flavor. Remember the duck does not have a lot of fat, not a lot of marbling, so you have to kind of protect that meat a little bit. Keep the juices in by just sauteing it very quickly, very, very quickly, just to sear in that nice flavor. And once that's done, of course, it doesn't take long, just a couple of minutes, you want to go ahead and take it out of the heat and put it on the platter ready to make the hopping john. In fact, I'm going to take it out because that's all you need, just a very quick little saute of uh, the breast. These are very tender too, so you want to move them out. Okay, I'm going to move this out of the way and bring my, uh, fire up this other little pot. I'm going to take this cast iron pot and put a little buttery flavored oil into it to start my Hoppin' John. Just a regular jambalaya, as I would call it, a different flavor of a jambalaya. Into the pot, a little onions, naturally. How can you cook anything in Louisiana without onions? Celery, bell pepper. And I, you see, I often use all the different colored bell peppers, the red, especially in rice dishes, because this is going to be a casserole. So you want to put some pretty colors in here. Otherwise, you're really missing an opportunity to show it up at its best. So you go ahead and put all of that nice colored flavor in there. Then, of course, garlic, a lot of great garlic. Remember, Donaldsonville has a lot of diversity in cultures, so garlic would be a really nice flavor here. This particular dish, this Hoppin' John recipe that I'm making here was one of the favorites of one of my great friends from Donaldsonville, Gaston Hirsch, who uh, in fact was a guest on my show once. He was shown in a couple of the shows that we did, and Gaston died a couple of years ago, so I'm doing this dish in his honor today. My good buddy Gaston, I know he would love this dish if he was still around. Great, great, great flavor here. Once that's in the pot, of course, now 
I'm going to add my other ingredients from the platter. I'm going to add some tassel ham, that nice spicy Cajun ham from Louisiana. I'm going to put that in. And then, of course, the black-eyed peas, the congri from the Africans go down into the pot. And then a little herbs, basil, thyme. And then, of course, I'm going to put some little rounds of corn. I cut right through the cob. And then I'm going to put some nice stock. Now, where will the stock come from? Well, I've deboned the little teal ducks. So I've made a stock. I have a little stock pot going here. And in the stock pot, I have the bones of the, the uh, teal duck. I have some nice carrots. I have bay leaf and herbs. I've boiled this for about an hour to create a wonderful duck stock. And now I'm going to take it and put right into my pot. Remember when making jambalayas or making rice dishes, you want to remember the formula. It's very, very easy. A cup and a half of liquid for every cup of rice. It's going to be perfect if you do that. A cup and a half of uh, water or stock to a cup of rice. Now, once that's in, a little bit tomato sauce for color. You want to give it a little red color. That's always nice in this dish. And then season it, salt and pepper. Again, let all of the spices that you normally use go down into the pot. And then add your rice. Let this come to a rolling boil first. Add the rice. Let's assume that this is to a rolling boil. This is a pecan flavored rice. So it's going to give this dish a nice pecan flavor. There's that boil. And then go ahead and put the duck breast right down into the top of the pot like this. What a fantastic dish. It's going to cook very quickly. It takes only about 30 to 40 minutes for this casserole to cook. And then put a little pecans in. The pecans will give that nutty flavor. And then finish it with green onions and parsley. Look how pretty that dish looks. Just a little green onions and parsley. Cover it. You want to make sure you cover it to keep all of that steam in. And then lower the fire to simmer and just let it sit there for 30 minutes. And let me show you what it looks like when it's all done. This is a gorgeous dish to a nice dish for the center of the table. Take a look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? And look at the little breast of teal right here. Here's the corn and, of course, the ham, the tasso ham is in here. Really a nice dish. And I'm going to put a little bit more of that purple cabbage and carrot right on the top for more color. Very, very interesting casserole, and you can use it as a main dish or as a side dish. If you're going to have a nice goose, which I'm going to cook now, this would be a great accompanying dish. And by the way, I want you to take a quick look at this bowl again. This is my Ivanhoe bowl dating back to about the late 1700s or very early 1800s. Gorgeous, gorgeous bowl coming out of England. Just beautiful dish. And I'm going to put that right here, and you have to see this next Goose, take a look at this. This is a speckle belly goose brought to me by a hunter. This came out of the wilds of the swamplands of Louisiana, and we actually take it. And you want to uh, uh, let this marinate. I like to put it in red wine for a day or so, which gives it this dark color. Just let it sit in the red wine to, uh, to, to color and also flavor. But then to season this, you want to go right under the breast. I turn the duck over on its belly so I can have a the, the exposure to the rib cage, and I just run my knife right down the back of the breast on each side like this. Just kind of go down into it, and you want to put all of the good flavors here. I'm going to add garlic, green onions right down into that slit, kind of push it down in there, garlic and green onions. The more the merrier, too. Put a lot of garlic down in here. Then come in with salt and pepper, and of course, any herbs and spices that you like should also go down right into those little slits, put it down in there. And then bacon. Bacon will add moisture, smoke, flavor, uh, larding. To, because remember, again, this is not a very fat piece of meat. This is a wild goose. And then turn it over and go ahead and flavor it more with salt and pepper on the outside like this. And then a lot of it on the inside. I'm going to put a lot of salt and pepper on the inside of that goose. And then for further flavor, carrots, celery, Put all of your best spices, all of your best ingredients, apples, where, regardless, wherever you live, whatever fruits are in season, throw them inside of a goose. I mean, that's where all the good flavor comes from, and you want sweets in here. So I'm going to put all of that in, and now that that's totally seasoned, I'm going to show you how we're going to bake it. I'm going to pot roast this, but first, I have to show you 
the pot that I'm going to roast it in. This is one of those old Cajun Dutch ovens. And even the lid of this Dutch oven is colored with the really nice, I mean, uh, decorated with a nice duck scene, with a nice goose scene flying over the bayous of Louisiana. And I put the goose right on the inside of this roast. And you see that I have carrots. You can use any nice vegetable. You can use uh, celery just to keep the goose from sticking. I'm going to come around the outside with oyster mushrooms. This is the wild oyster mushrooms of Louisiana, perfect for wild game. I'm going to come with more of the fruit and all of that stuff around here. You want to put, again, let your imagination run wild with all of these nice fresh vegetables. I'm going to squeeze mandarins on top of it. Squeeze the mandarin juice right on top of the goose and then put the mandarin peels in the belly and then, of course, come on top with a little bit shredded mandarin peel. You can look at this and tell that it's going to be a fantastic dish. Now, of course, I would put the lid on. I'm going to put it in the oven 350 degrees for about two hours. And then when it uh, sits in, in the oven for two hours, go ahead and take the lid off and allow it to brown for just a minute until it gets that perfect color. But you want to keep the lid on during the cooking process. There you go, 350 degrees. And it's going to cook just beautifully. I have to show you what that finished dish looks like. Just take a look at this thing. If that's not the prettiest wild goose. Again, on my Ivanhoe platter, just a gorgeous dish. And you can come back and decorate this thing any way you would like. I like to just come around the edge of it with more of those little oranges or kumquats because it has such a beautiful finish. Isn't that nice? Great goose. Now, a couple dishes that I found at the Sunshine Festival that we can share with you today. Take a look at this little basket. Big Italian community in Donaldsonville. And of course, this is the Italian cookies. You'll find them all over the town of Donaldsonville, especially on holidays. And right next to it, this would definitely be served with any wild goose or any game dish. The wonderful little stuffed pumpkins. I've actually put pecans and brown sugar. Great, great dish for any game dinner. Now, I told you that I had my good buddy who taught me a lot about cooking, Rosemary Sims Birnbaum. She's coming into the kitchen, and we're going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite dishes as she's coming in. How you doing, Rosemary? Hi, sweetie. Good hey, to see give me a big hug. How you been? Fine, fine. Well, I tell you, you're looking terrific. How's everything in Donaldsonville? <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. All the family okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, good, good. I just, I was sharing with them just now that you're, you're one of the few people who still call me Johnny when you see me. <laughs> well, what other name is it? <laughs> what other name is that? Right. You know, last time we were talking, we were talking about that great uh, 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 potato, the mashed potatoes that I always serve with wild yes. game, and I want to share that recipe with okay. them. Come give me a hand here. Okay. I start off with this uh, really nice pot here. Now, this is really strange because I'm going to start off my potatoes by cooking them in milk, which most people would never do. Oh, fats this and fats that. Moderation, that's the secret. So I'm starting here with a little bit of milk in my pot. I've cut my potatoes. See this, Rosie, about, yes. what's that, about half inch or so? I've yeah, got them about right, half inch to right. one inch cubes. And I'm going to put them down into the boiling milk, just like this. Mm -hmm. And then the secret to my potatoes is a handful, one clove of garlic for every potato going into the pot. That's the secret there. A lot of people would say, what? you got to be Absolutely. kidding. Absolutely, I love it. And then, of course, some salt and pepper. And I would allow this to come to a boil. You want to uh, let the potatoes really get nice and tender mm -hmm. in the dish. And once that's done, of course, you drain them, save a little bit of the milk, but all of the garlic. I have some down here. Let's you and I go okay. whip them together to show them exactly how that dish comes together. Oh, okay. How, how's this? Look at the garlic right here. All yeah. the garlic is right in the... Oh, I, didn't, I thought you'd throw it away, but you didn't. Oh, you got to be kidding, huh? No, this is okay. nice garlic here. <laughs> the potatoes okay. are nice and tender. Now, okay. I'm put a little bit of butter in here, Rosie. Oh, huh? my God. <laughs> you think there's too much butter? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead. This is only about a quarter pound. This is mashed oh, yeah. potatoes, huh? Right. And now a little bit salt and pepper. I'm going to okay. put a little bit of that in there, as much as you like. And again, of course, you can put whatever flavors you want. I'm saying this is hot milk coming right out of the pot. Wow. And you want to kind of mash that down a little bit and then use your favorite whip. I like chunks and lumps in my potatoes, too. You know, a lot of times people think that lumpy or, or potatoes that have the little uh, 
chunks of potato in it when they're mashed are just bad, but I'll tell mm -hmm. you what, I don't think so. You'd want to continue to mash this. Use your electric blender yeah. or mixer. I think everybody has the idea. Finish it with parsley, but the garlic is mashed in with the potatoes and the milk. It's absolutely magnificent, and we're going to eat this and finish it just a little bit later. You can <laughs> smell that garlic, huh? Yes. Hooray, nice yeah. parsley. Rosa, let's talk a little bit about Donaldsonville. Most mm -hmm. people would never even begin to realize that in some fashion, it was an English colony when Absolutely, it was founded. Absolutely, it was. Uh, what happened was that the people from the Carolinas came down to our area looking for more uh, farmland that would, they could uh, use. And that's what really originally brought them down. St. Emma Plantation was owned by Bartons, and uh, the, many of the plantation homes were owned. My husband, the Sims family, came from South Sioux City. You know, right. so, so lots of them came down here. Right, exactly, and the, and the gentleman who was the first mayor of the city, was the first postmaster, right. was also uh, English and, right. built, and built my house in the, in the center of Downsville, Andrew Gingray also That's coming right. from it. And, but people never think of South Louisiana as an English colony, but the rolling Felicianas were the same. That's right, so, that's right. Another thing that most people never think of that little bitty sleepy South Louisiana town as is a 19th century, or was a 19th century, thriving metropolis. Absolutely, absolutely. We had businesses that were succeeding. We have a business called Lemons that was the oldest uh, business in the state of Louisiana owned by the same family. And it went on for years and they did everything. I mean, they did uh, uh, hardware and food and, and mercantile and farm equipment and the whole business. It was also one of the largest department yes, 60, stores in the south. 60,000 square feet. And one store. What year was that store built? Uh, no, 1821, I think. <laughs> 1820, 60,000 square feet. Yeah. Do you think the location of the town of Donaldsonville had anything to do with its prosperity back then? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the town of Donaldsonville is in the uh, configuration of the Mississippi River and Bay Lafourche. And of course, all of the uh, transportation was by water. And so the sugarcane farmers, which is our main crop, would stay at the bell house to watch the, uh, 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 what do you call them, the, the boats come, and, and to, to catch, to go to New Orleans or wherever they were going. And then, of course, the Mississippi River went into Bay Lafourche, which, by the way, is the oldest uh, and longest street in the world, populated. And, and so all of Bay Lafourche was used. As and, and it's a town of such tremendous cultural diversity. The nations, the people that settle there are just That's incredible. Right. That's right. We have a little bit of everything. When I uh, headed Asher, we had the black community, we had the Italian community, we had the uh, uh, French community, and there are many more. The Irish there, the, the English. The Jewish community. And the it? Jewish community. There was a very large Jewish community. Which brings us to the cemetery, I mean, which is right. on the historic district, the Jewish cemetery. <clears throat> now, that is one of the largest Jewish cemeteries. And your friend cemeteries. Gaston was the one for so many <laughs> years. And now my husband, Irv, is in charge. Of it. <clears throat> well, you know, I, when, when people think of a Jewish cemetery, the largest out of a major city anywhere in the country mm -hmm. being in Donaldsonville, they, yeah. that must drive them crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it is worth seeing. What really? about the architecture? We saw some of the beautiful buildings, yeah. but the architecture yeah. is phenomenal in that little yeah. town. Well, one thing we have, the oldest public building is the jail on Louisiana Square. Is there a Square. reason for that? <laughs> and the, court, oh, I don't know, but the, but the courthouse is magnificent. It looks like something uh, out of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Right, that right, building? sure. And uh, just, well, all of Louisiana Square, we have a little building there that was the first black doctor's uh, office. And uh, it now holds some museum pieces in it. Now, now the whole area, though, the, the, the town, the area, mm -hmm. the country that we're in is really undergoing a, a transformation at this mm -hmm. point, right? Before we get to that, can I mention your house and mine? Well, you can mention my house. <laughs> sure, I think so. Well, it is the oldest home in Donaldsonville that mine? still stands. It survived the Civil War. Right. You know, and, and uh, mine is a, uh, a Victorian townhouse that was built in 1890. And uh, it's it's a pretty. My uh, home was used as as a union encampment, a union office building. In fact, during the Civil War, and that's one of the reasons that it's still standing today. Otherwise, that's I'm right. sure it when the town was burned, they would have it would have been gone. Uh, talking about the transformation, though, we saw a transformation a couple of years ago yeah. from agricultural to petrochemical. Has that been good or bad? Well, it's been good and bad. I mean, the, the, of course, the sugar people, which is our main industry, might have had some objections to it, but we needed 
we needed that. We really did. And I can remember in the, in the 40s having a senator from Washington come and say, someday you will be the Ruhr Valley of the United and, States. And it certainly and, looks that way. And, and it looks that way. And I think it has been a help to the community. It's created jobs. You know. It's, right, sure. So uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's been an, an asset. Uh, Rosa, do you think we'll be able to save that little bitty town? Absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think I could <laughs> save it. We could save it. I belong to a strategic planning committee. There are always committees that are, are being formed. You know. Well, I think really that together we can definitely put our, put our hearts and our heads together to, yes. to, to help to make that town work for us. So, hey, thank Absolutely. you so much for coming Glad to visit to with us. And mm -hmm. thank all of you for stopping by as we continue to visit fairs and festivals and cook up more great taste <laughs> of Louisiana. Thank you so much. We're going to finish these potatoes over here. Funding for this program is provided by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Vieux Carré, Zydeco, Achafalaya, Natchitoches. In Louisiana, you'll say things you've never seen before. More information on events in Louisiana can be yours at no cost. Call 1-800-36-GUMBO for your free Louisiana tour guide, listing festivals, attractions, and points of interest throughout the Bayou State. Chef John Fulce's Louisiana Sampler, a companion cookbook to this series, contains the colorful history and culinary secrets behind Louisiana's most exciting festivals. For your copy, send a check or money order for $19.95 to Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Or use your credit card by calling toll-free 1-800-973-7246.